Small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School. It's a new kind of school. Together, we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. Small Business School is made possible by support from the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. There's no wait at the post office in your own office. USPS.com is waiting for you. And by Microsoft. We see you building a new company from an old company. We see a business full of potential. We are inspired to create software that helps you reach it. Hi, I'm Hattie Bryant, and this is Small Business School. You can learn here how to start, run, and grow a business from people who've already done it. Remigius Shattis took his idea from mind to market and on to Wall Street. Step into our master class to learn from a man who's done it all. Every town needs people like Remigius Shattis. They cultivate dreams, the deep-seated dream. Every adult American has an idea for a business. Shattis has taken the Silicon Valley model into the heartlands of America. And if it can happen in Huntsville, it should happen everywhere. Wires, connections, security, control. Headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama, Avocent, formerly Cybex, prior to its 2000 merger with its largest competitor, Apex, makes a box to remotely control PCs and servers from 25 feet to 25,000 miles. For each one of these buttons, you can have a computer attached and only have one keyboard and monitor and mouse. And you can just switch to any one of those by pushing the button, or you can do it from your keyboard. You can select from your keyboard. And if you had a thousand servers, that means you would have a thousand keyboards and monitors and mice without this type of product. But now you only have to have one. But the best thing about this building it was After years of struggle, founder Remigius Shattis, who likes to be called simply Shattis, and company CEO and President Steve Thornton are proud of $228 million in sales in 2000 and they enjoy a market capitalization of $2 billion. They have facilities like this one elsewhere, in Redmond, Washington, Shannon, Ireland, and offices in Steinhagen in Munich, Germany, Singapore, and Tokyo. Avocent is the world's leading supplier of KVM, or keyboard, video, and switching extension and remote access products. The bottom line of the KVM switch market is that we take and we provide the services to keep the backbone of the network running. And we make a very large problem manageable. It's just, uh, it's just astounding how we change the access and control of servers. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, that's, that's why we're successful. When we started and didn't have a lot of money, it was all we could do to build 25 of a product. And we would agonize over building 25 boards and then 50 boards. And then we got to Nirvana. We were able to build 100 yeah. boards at a time. Well, an, an example, I, 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 can make, I can give you an example of that. Uh, the, the first year I was here, uh, we did $169,000 in sales. Today, that would be a bad morning. My illumination came when I was working in a garment factory about 50 miles away from here in a very poor region of the state. And I couldn't get a job back after the space boom collapsed in 1969. And I had to go 50 miles away, and I had a degree in mathematics, but there was no jobs in Huntsville. I started out as a computer operator and became a programmer, and I enjoyed my job. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy the way the employees were treated. Oh. And a lot of times I have to work all night to keep all the work, get all the work done, because you couldn't do the programming during the day because we were running production. Right. So I remember one time um, leaving early in the morning, the sun was rising, and I was having to drive into the sun, and it was in a December, there was frost on the ground, and there was a million sparkles of frost everywhere, and I just thought, I would like to start a business 
where people enjoyed coming to work every morning. Hmm. So I never looked at it as I have to start something for myself. I always looked at it as what can I do for the other people. I had a lot of ideas and I watched that, the ideas that I had being done by other people and they're making money on it. And after a while it gets to you, but I was working for a, a well-known company here in town and I finally realized that the training that I was getting and the responsibilities that I had at that company would let me go on and do my own business. Mm -hmm. And so I got a little bit of confidence and I think I was about 29 years old when I decided I do have to leave and do this thing because I got the bug and I call it the bug of ambition. Um. And I found out the bug of ambition is fatal. Once you've caught it, there's no cure except success. And it just drives your life. I didn't know at the time in, the, in my early 30s that what you have to do is look at markets. I was still looking at products. Um. And the difference between a small company and a large company is the transition between the product mentality and the market mentality. Okay. So what you're saying is don't just start a business based on something you think you might want to make. Look at what the market wants. Look at what the customers want. And the success of Cybex was driven by what customers asked for. We always listened to what the customers wanted. And in our very first product that was successful, I was the customer because I had been installing computers on a contract we had with Marshall Space Flight Center. Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctly that the PCs that we were installing, they were PC XTs with the 10 megabyte hard drives, mm -hmm. they wouldn't fit on the desks. Too and big. I remember yeah. trying to get the computer back on there and give myself bend radius for the cable. And I couldn't get the bend radius for the cable without hurting the printer cable and get the keyboard to fit on the desk. And I thought, this is too big for the desk. We've got to get the computer off the desk. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to our first successful hardware product, which we called the Extender. That was like, dong, 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 dong. <laughs> Well, what was in intriguing about it was, I'm a mathematician, I'm not an engineer. Every engineer said it was impossible, and I just didn't believe it. So I came in that Saturday morning, and I was kind of excited. Yeah. And I hooked it up the, no the new way that I had thought about hooking it up, and by that afternoon I had it working. I was stupefied. <laughs> so I left it working over the weekend, and everybody coming in that Monday morning was able to see a keyboard and a video 150 feet away from a computer that was still running. I knew we had a product. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so f six years of what? Struggle, try? Struggle, starvation, uh, problems. I was so bad off that the two founders left before we got started, and so I started thinking, I've got to change the way I'm doing things. I'm not thinking the right way. So it turned out that a friend of mine that was working for this, had, had worked for the same company, and who was probably the best manager that that company ever had, and who had made it up to the title of vice president, mm -hmm. uh, was at a position where he was looking for a job. Mm -hmm. And I was recruiting him for my board of directors. And he says, well, why, don't we just, why don't I just come to work for the company? And I, and I thought, this is great. This is what I need. Right. I need someone that understands business. Right. Because I had proven that I didn't. Uh huh. And that was? Steve Thornton. And one year, I was turned down seven times by different banks. Uh, and nobody would loan us any money. We're too risky, or not a good loan for us. Or, you know, I had all sorts of reasons. Uh, but uh, eventually we found somebody to loan us some money. And uh, once we became profitable, uh, we've been able to increase our uh, line of credit consistently since then. And we have had record profits since 1989. When you go through something like this, if you ever become successful, it was fun. If you not end up successful, it wasn't fun. Uh, Shadows has always had a good vision of what the market's going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so one day, uh, a person at a nuclear power plant up in somewhere in the New York area called us and said, we need a way of taking two computers that are 25 feet away from the operator and building a switch that you can switch and use one keyboard and one video screen to look at those bo both of those computers. And so Steve came back and asked us, could we do such a thing? And I said, yes, we can do that. And Steve says, I wasn't asking you, I was asking Bob. <laughs> because I said yes to everything. I was gonna say, <laughs> <laughs> then Bob said. And Bob says, well, I think we can. So Bob did a drawing and we gave it to the ladies that were in manufacturing and that very afternoon, we had our first product of that type. We called it the Commander. It, 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 
Bob Asprey joined Shattis in 1982. Because Shattis says that you're the person who knows how to make things work. I try to do that. And sometimes I get lucky and it does. Sometimes. But it's so in terms of entrepreneurship, how many times do we have to get lucky in order to make it as a business owner? Each time. <laughs> There's always <laughs> luck involved in it. There's always luck involved in anything. Right. But you have to be ready to take advantage of it when it strikes. Were, did you ever have a dark moment when you said, I don't know if we're going to make it or not? Oh, yes. <laughs> Very dark moments. What lessons could you give someone who's tweaking a product now and frustrated they don't have an end result? A uh, major thing is keep, a, keep your focus on what you're trying to do. In other words, avoid bells, whistles, and all the other stuff. Look at what your customer really wants. The temptation, all engineers want to put, you know, if the guy says, I need a flashlight, he ends up with one of those six switches on it and six adjustments, and that's not what you want to do. And it's so easy to fall into that trap of just keep adding, 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 and that's, you lose your market windows, you lose your cost advantages and everything else. So, you know, stay focused. So peel back, find out exactly how the customer is going to use the product and only give them what they're going to use. What they really want. What they want. Not what, what you think they want. Okay. Bob was important to the mix because I could dream things up, but Bob could get them to work. In July 1995, the company went public on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange and was listed in Business Week's hottest growth companies in the USA in 1996, 97, and 98, and was recently ranked 78 in Forbes Magazine's top 200 small companies in the USA. So what you have to do, the explosive growth phase, is you've got to change your thinking. Mm -hmm. You've got to quit thinking small. You've got to quit thinking, how can I capture this market? Okay. And I think that's what happened to us. We realized that we had something that was so hot, so hot that we couldn't do it all ourselves. In fact, we tried to build the first auto boots uh, and load the PC boards back in the shop. We mm -hmm. built 100 boards, mm -hmm. and we had great people working for us. But we found out that of those 100 boards we built, only a very few of them worked. So you have to outsource? And Steve and I, Steve and I looked at it, and we says, we can't continue with this. Right. And it broke our manufacturing manager's heart because he wanted to build it in-house. Right. Because he'd been trained to do that. So we said, Jimmy, we're going to have to outsource this. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. So today the company has about the same number of people using a soldering iron as it did 10 years ago. We were experts at defining what the customer needed to have for their next generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we became an engineering uh, software, uh, inter internal firmware, mm -hmm. and basically a marketing company. Okay. And that's okay. how the company has grown so so well. Why do you think you all became so successful? Um, we lucked out, got the right team together, hit, picked a market that wasn't saturated, that nobody was in, and essentially pioneered the market and managed to keep a big chunk of it. The main thing you need to know is that you can't do it all yourself. You have to get like-minded people and build a team because a one-man show just is limited to a one-man show. The way that you build a great company, it's like if you go to a stream bed and look where the water's been running, all the pebbles are around. You don't find any square pebbles. So what you've got to do is get a mix of people where things get, get rubbed off and they can work together as a team and not be ego-bound. The founding team has to have a clear vision of what they want to produce, and they've got to hatch the baby. And then they've got to get the baby to where it can crawl, and then where it can walk, and then they've got to say, okay, this is where my, lim where my limits are. And there's a point in your life in a company where you've got to change from being the person that's doing the molding and the shaping and the guiding to where you're just a parent and the child goes off. How'd you keep believing in your ideas? It was very simple. We had no other choice but to keep on doing it. But no, 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 you guys all are smart. You have degrees in this and that, your math, out of the, you could have gotten a job. Sure, but that means giving up. And it means the humiliation of giving up. I look at people in two groups. I look at the people that say, what can I do to help? And then I can say, look at the other group that says, what's in it for me? I try to find people that are willing to work toward a common goal. And I try to find people that are willing to believe in the future and that things can be done. And it's a person that maybe not be fully may not be fully grown up in saying that that's impossible. You're looking for matched values because your goal 
is for everyone to be successful. And you can't bring someone in the group who personally is the only one who wants, I want to be successful. That's it can't absolutely. be about me, it's got to be about us. That's absolutely correct. Beyond that, I mean, how do you make sure people are happy and coming oh. to work with joy and doing their best? Well, you share the wealth. Okay. The one thing that we did at, SC, at, uh, at Cybex is we always made sure that we had something for everyone. Okay, what do you mean something for everyone? Well, we had so many years of hard times that when we started having um, some profits, we had bonuses. Okay. So, in fact, very, in fact, the very first bonus that we had was given out because we didn't have the cash to pay the taxes on the income that we would have had. <laughs> So I know, I we declared a bonus. Right, and of course, right. Then we got, didn't have to pay any taxes. <laughs> you have 75 days to pay the cash, right? And still take the expense, and we made it just in time. Phew. And then the people that are very, very key to the effort, they should be equity partners. Okay. At what and, point, though, do you say, or do they come to you? Talk to me about this, because there are people watching this right now who have good companies and great people, and maybe they need to, to figure out a way to share the, the ownership, and they've never done that before. It really depends on the owner. There's certain owners that aren't comfortable in thinking of this, and it causes them grave mental distress, and mm -hmm. so they shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But if they can't share the wealth, they should sell their company. Shadis hit a home run with Cybex. It looks easy now, but don't forget that many years of struggle preceded what we see today. Learn this from Shadis. The inventor is probably not the person who can grow a company. Shadis moved himself out of the CEO position early on. Even though there wasn't a lot of cash, he brought in Steve Thornton to run the company and took the chief technology position himself. Only after Cybex came through a successful initial public offering, a merger, and got a new name, leaving it large and strong, did Shaddis leave for his next startup. To understand this to the core, we can go back to another entrepreneur who told us, to run a business, you need a strong ego, not a big ego. This means you don't have to be in charge of everything and you don't have to have CEO on your business card. If your business is stuck, maybe you are the obstacle. Maybe you need to be the chief bottle washer and hire a person who can lead your company into the future. You can learn more at smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video, transcripts, and interactive study guides. With that, I'd like to introduce Terry Heaton. At the monthly Answer Angel Breakfast. Investor Breakfast, Shaddis and Bob listen as Terry Heaton, the CEO of Answer.com, pitches for a second round of funding. Answer itself is an acronym. It means a new style in relating. Uh, Why is Shaddis important to your venture? Shaddis is a real angel. Uh, I mean, he personifies that word angel. He invests in people, not in business plans. and. Uh, we needed somebody like him. He's kept us going. Uh, without Remedia Shaddis, answer communications would not exist today. I invested in Terry because he and his wife Sandra had put their entire lives into this product. And secondly, he was willing to listen. Shaddis and Bob formed r and Ventures to provide seed money for ideas that venture capitalists and bankers would consider to be too risky. Jeff Cameron's research attracted their attention. And one of the things we have found from this particular experiment is that the, the uh, rotor is moving in the direction that apparent ion wind is being generated. Well, r and Ventures has got about between 20 and 30 investments. I mean, if I don't have a million dollars, if I just have a few thousand, can I be an angel? Can I invest? Everyone can invest. And that was one of the things that we looked at was Cybex was helped early on, not just by people that were angels, but by friends and family. And I think almost everyone knows an entrepreneur that's trying to make a business happen. And I think that people should get involved, but they shouldn't get involved in just one. I've always felt they shouldn't get involved in several because investing in the beginnings of companies is very risky. Mm -hmm. And so you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket and you should only use money that you can afford to lose. How do I go about selecting the investment that I'm gonna make? That's a difficult thing and what you've got to do is you should invest in the person. You should look at a person that's committed to making the enterprise work and don't just invest in some great idea. 
because great ideas have a way of disappearing or being eclipsed by somebody else. Why is this investing locally um, better than investing in Wall Street? You should do that too. But investing locally is a walk on the wild side. And what you can't get investing in Wall Street, you can't always get that satisfaction of seeing that business grow and, and prosper. Shadda serves on the board of BizTech, a business incubator that offers a jumpstart to technology companies. These people are my clients. You mean you've, you, have you invested in some of these people? Yes. On that left-hand side, I've invested in all of those. And this is the perfect place to start a small business. Joanne Randolph is the executive director of BizTech. Yes, we do have a very stringent admissions process. We're looking for technology-oriented companies that are e developing emerging technologies for the global marketplace. Mm -hmm. And they have to have a business plan. Okay. They have to have the beginnings of a good management team. Its client companies raised over $2 million in year 2000, all of which is angel funding, mostly at 10,000 and 25,000 and 50,000 increments. They also produced annual revenues of almost $4 million, created 70 new jobs at an annual payroll of $2.7 million. Not bad for a handful of startups. Shadis is one that we go to for logical investments, logical development steps. Shadis is one that just has that knack of understanding, you know, the entrepreneurial you know, step that you need to take. So we go to him regularly for that and Good. we try to access him you know once a month at least touch base with him so what do you think he's doing or how has he infected other people with his enthusiasm oh yeah oh yeah uh, sometimes it takes that first check and then other people are are you know right behind him and he's he's hit some pretty some pretty successful investments here so now a lot of people are starting to pay attention to what he invests in okay. and if if all the other successful entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in Huntsville would would do a tenth of what he does, this would be an amazing world. What's driving you now? What's driving me is the prospect of giving back. What we all can do is give so much back to the community and help new enterprises start faster and blossom quicker. Mm -hmm. Huntsville is a fantastic place to build a technology company. First of all, we've got one of the highest concentrations of engineers and scientists of any place in the country. We've got a great standard of living. We've got a low cost of living. We've got excellent schools. My goal is for Huntsville to be the most generous city in America. Our marketing advisor, John Wargo, says all marketing is not the same. Marketing is your plan. This is the way you're going to take your product or service to the marketplace. So think of marketing as your plan. Direct marketing is how you execute your plan. Now, within direct marketing, there's a couple of different phases. You have direct sales, telephone sales, direct mail. So what it is, is the, the, it's the difference between planning and execution. Okay, but if when I see big companies, big Fortune 500 companies with big full page ads in the newspaper and there's no call to action, there's no phone number to call, it's just a big we're great that kind of ad. To me that seems like marketing whereas when I get a piece of mail, do you want to buy this, that seems like direct marketing. Am I right or wrong? Well, I think that advertising does a variety of different functions. Uh, frequently when you see these ads, that are really corporate ads. And what they're designed to do is to try to convince the public to have a different view or a different perception of that company or that brand. Mm -hmm. And they may be trying to influence them either because of their stock, uh, because of a variety of other issues, mm -hmm. uh, but they're using advertising for a corporate communication, which is far different than using advertising directly for sales. And you're right, most small businesses don't have the luxury Mm -hmm. Okay, of actually promoting their brand or their company without some call to action. Okay. My personal belief mm -hmm. is a good product at a good price at the right place is the right kind of advertising. Uh, most small businessmen, what they do, they execute and they do it right. What you need to do is just sit back and say, what is it that I did and what did I do right? Then you write your strategy. You don't have to write your strategy first. 
Wow, I love this. All you have to do <laughs> is to say what works and then figure out why it worked. Okay. So tactics could drive strategy, which is not what they teach you in business school. Make it work, then figure out the strategy. Remember, if your business is stuck, maybe you are the obstacle. Maybe you need to be the chief bottle washer and hire a person who can lead your company into the future. We'll see you next time. Small Business School is made possible by support from the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. There's no wait at the post office in your own office. USPS.com is waiting for you. And by Microsoft. We see you building a new company from an old company. We see a business full of potential. We are inspired to create software that helps you reach it. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs. Small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do this, my life won't be complete.